I am pleased to introduce Chris Entz, a New York Times bestselling author who has been writing about women of the Old West for more than 20 years. She has penned more than 40 published books on the subject. Her work has been honored with five Will Rogers Medallion Awards, an Elmer Hulton Book Award, an Oklahoma Center for the Book Award, and was a Western Writers of America Spur finalist. Her books, The Pinks, The First Women Detectives, Operatives, and Spies with the Pinkerton, Natural Detective. <laughs> that's a really long it's, title. It's, it's a lot, it's a okay. lot to say. It's a really long title. Okay. Has been optioned by NBC uh, for currently in development as a TV series. And his most recent works include, according to Kate, The Legendary Life of Big Nose Kate Elder, Love of Doc Holliday, and No Place for a Woman, The Fight for Suffrage in the Wild West, and Iron Woman, The Ladies Who Helped Build the Railroad. And I just heard, we, so Sharon back there has a few copies of books, but she's trying to get more. Um, and I just heard that Iron Women is at the Railroad Museum. So if you want to get that one, and we have big, according to Kate back here. Yes. Okay, so thank you all for coming. And Well, thank you all very much. I'm glad that you're here. We're gonna have an evening where we're gonna be talking about um, some of these amazing women who helped settle the American frontier. And I've been doing this for a really long time. It's funny how whenever you talk about women of the West, generally they fall into two categories. People think they're either Miss Kitty from Dodge City or Laura Ingalls from Little House on the Prairie. They don't think that they did much in between, but I'm here to tell you that after more than 50 books actually on the subject of women of the Old West, I can tell you that they served in a variety of uh, job capacities. They were business women, they were entrepreneurs. Um, and certainly tonight in my talk with you, I'm not gonna leave out those fanciful soil doves or any of those wonderful teachers. We'll talk about that too a little bit, but just to let you know right off that they did do a variety of things. And I brought some of the books tonight to talk to you about. Um, I've been able to do maybe five books that are biographies that are a departure from what I ordinarily do. And um, I've written about John Wayne and I got to write two books about Roy Rogers and Dale Evans. Um, does anybody here know what Roy Rogers' name was before Leonard it was Roy Clark. Rogers? Very good, and you win a book. Dang it, I could have won a book. I brought a copy of The Cowboy and the Senorita for you, so there you go. They were, they were quite an amazing couple. A lot of people don't know that Dale Evans was married three times before she married Roy. So that particular book tells all you all, everything you want to know about uh, Roy and Dale. But just, oh, did they really? Wow. You know, when I wrote the biography about them, I was in Victorville and I did a lot of the research because they had a museum there in Victorville. And I went through about 65 boxes that the family hadn't gone through in a long, long time. And one of the boxes was filled with love letters to, to Roy. And some of them were just women that were absolutely crushed when he married Dale. One of the letters was from a woman that said after after the news that he married Dale came out, she wrote and said, I no longer need my ovaries. I thought that was, I thought that was interesting. And so you honest to goodness believe that you had a shot at Roy. So, um, but I have um, done a lot of work on, um, on the women of the West and I've just enjoyed every single moment of it. I uh, live in Grass Valley, California. And I started writing about women of the American frontier there. 
Uh, prior to that, I wanted to be a stand-up comedian. I don't know whether anybody's any heard of, anybody's heard of Tody Fields, but when I was growing up, she was everything. And that's, I wanted to be like Tody Fields, but it didn't necessarily happen that way because doing stand-up comedy is nothing like you think it's gonna be in real life. So um, I'm glad that I have been writing these books. You may read the books and think she's still into stand-up comedy, but you know. <laughs> um, anyway, when I, being in Grass Valley, California, I was working at the radio station there and I was doing historical moments and one of the moments that I, that I wrote about was a uh, wagon train party that traveled west in 1846. And it was made up of more than 80 men and only one woman. And her name was Mrs. Benjamin Kelsey. And she made the entire four month journey barefoot carrying a one-year-old baby on her hip. And I thought, this is absolutely amazing. Her story must be told. First, I have to find out what her name is because she's just listed as Mrs. Benjamin Kelsey, which is proper and, and that's the way people talk then. They would never have written down, when I was feeling low in my spirit, I look back and saw Nancy. They would never do that, that was disrespectful. So it was respectful to call someone Mrs. Benjamin Kelsey or whoever they were married to. So um, finding out about Nancy is kind of what did it for me. And I started from there writing about these amazing women and I live in an area where um, hard rock mining was really big. And uh, a lot of the places that we had in town were cat houses. And um, there are some people that don't like to think that there were that many houses of ill repute in the little town, but there's either a saloon or house of ill repute when they were first starting out or a combination of both. Um, but um, I, I went from writing about people like Mrs. Benjamin Kelsey to writing a book called Wicked Women, which is all about those amazing soil doves. And this lady on the front, um, this lady on the front is Calamity Jane. Now Calamity Jane, a lot of people don't know that Calamity Jane was at one time a prostitute. We know Calamity Jane from being the rough rider that she was. And, um, you know, just being able to take on any man in any kind of situation. But she started out, um, she grew up in Missouri. Her parents died when she, was, when she was young and left her taking care of her brothers and sisters. And she makes this journey into uh, Wyoming with a wagon train with her brothers and sisters. And it's there that she decides that she is going to make sure that her siblings get adopted out. A lot of people coming west with their children lost their children coming west. And so they needed to have not only someone else that, that they could love as their child, but also someone else that could help them uh, run their, their farms, help them work their, their mining claims. I mean, kids were um, a valuable asset. Um, I don't think we do too much of that nowadays. I remember my husband and I were just at a restaurant and the guy was asking his kids what they wanted. My dad would never ask us what we wanted to eat unless we were paying. So, you know, you, you get what it, you're getting a happy meal. And if you don't like the cheeseburger with the, with the, with the onions, you just pick those off, but this is what you're getting. Um, and Calamity Jane was just a, a rough lady. And so part of this book is about Calamity. It's about some of the other, um, Amazing ladies, um, I love this particular woman here. This is um, Alice Tubbs, I believe. Let me get my specs on. Yeah, it's Poker Alice. This lady here is known as Poker Alice, the lady in the middle here with the cigar the size of a baby's behind. That was uh, Poker Alice. And Poker Alice was in Deadwood and uh, she, ran a, uh, she ran a saloon and a brothel and was also good at cards and uh, wasn't afraid to shoot people who stole from her. And uh, she did that on a number of occasions and was arrested a couple of times for that. She just was uh, a, a tough soul. Um, and so if you get a chance to come up and take a look at some of these books that I brought with me and you can see some of these amazing pictures. Uh, when I was working on uh, Wicked Women, I went ahead and started working on um, I wrote a series of books called Tales Behind the Tombstone. And it's about how famous people from the Old West died. We know a lot about how they lived, 
We just don't know a lot about how they died. And going from Calamity Jane being um, a woman that worked at, at a house of ill repute very at her, at her younger, in her younger days, um, I included her in this book called More Tales Behind the Tombstone, and it's about when she died. And when she passes away, she dies of pneumonia, but she was also a, a raving alcoholic, which contributed to her never getting better with the, uh, with the pneumonia. But when she dies, they lay her out in state um, in, a, in a coffin that's open up for everybody to go by and see the visitation, but they, they put her in a white dress. And people are outraged that she's in a white dress because this is Clamity Jane. She wore buckskin and leather and, and, and fringe. And why are you dressing her like this? And people were just kind of annoyed as they walked by. And so um, they started putting knives in her hand or laying weapons in her next to her. Um, things just got out of hand because as they kept walking by, then they started taking pieces of her dress they started taking pieces of her hair. They disturbed the body so much so that they had to wrap her in chicken wire uh, so everything could continue on. <laughs> but uh, Calamity was, uh, you know, she said that she was involved with Hickok. She knew Hickok. They came into Deadwood at the same time, but she didn't know Hickok like that. When she started talking about having a relationship with Bill Hickok, Bill Hickok had uh, passed away and dead men tell no lies. So, um, you know, there's nothing that he could have, he couldn't have refuted that particular sentiment. So um, what you have then is a whole string of history made up by um, Calamity Jane, and she was really good at being able to do that. But as one of my favorite authors is Dorothy Johnson. Dorothy Johnson wrote a book called, um, she wrote a short story that became a movie, and it was called The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance. Um, a lot of people don't know that a woman wrote that, but, but she writes in her short story, where fact is absent, print the legend. And that's kind of what calamity kind of thrived on, you know, good luck finding out if anything that I'm telling you is the actual truth, because it sounds so good when I say it. So um, Calam was just one of those kind of people. So, you know, when you're writing about those early ladies who were in the frontier towns, you have to include them. They weren't the totality of the ladies that were in town, but certainly there were a lot of them. A lot of business women were there. Um, I'm working on a book right now um, and it's called An Open Secret. And it's about a brothel in Deadwood. And the brothel in Deadwood was open in 18, I believe 1866, and it didn't close until 1954. But everybody knew that that was a brothel. It was started by Al Swearingen. Al, I don't know anybody's ever seen the, 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 um, the series Deadwood, but Al Swearingen was a guy who owned the gem theater there. And it, he, it was a saloon and I, I, we just use theater in quotes because what he would do is he would advertise for actresses and these young women would come west thinking that they're gonna be an actress on stage and they didn't have any way to get home and they would be indentured servants to him and eventually become prostitutes working for him. So the book that I'm working on called An Open Secret uh, is about that particular brothel that he started and, it's, and, and how long it lasted and the women that worked there. So I would be disingenuous to say that, they, that there weren't soiled doves because there certainly were. Um, but to think that they were the only ones, the only women that made up the West would not be accurate either. Um, one, of, one, of the, one of the little tidbits I learned when writing this book is women who were prostitutes in order to make a lot of money, depending on how many, and how many clients they had during the evening, during the day. And in order for them to have a number of clients, they would put a drop cloth at the end of their bed so the miner or the cowboy wouldn't have to take his boots off. And if he didn't have to take his boots off, then they didn't want their bed messed up. And so they had drop cloths at the bottom of the bed. What I find interesting is that every interior designing magazine that you ever see, you see a beautiful bedroom and then a drop cloth just on the bottom of that bed. People have no idea that came from a whorehouse they're just are decorating our home 
thinking that we've come up with this amazing idea when it was really something that you would have found at the Birdcage Theater. So, uh, so just so you know, the next time you're looking through a Martha Stewart living and you see that, go, Martha, did you have, you have no idea where this came from, so. And every motel, yeah, Every motel, maybe they're trying, maybe something else is going on in that motel before you actually get there, so. And then one of the most famous, um, one of the most famous women that I wrote about that was a soil dove is a lady that I, um, I was given her all of her personal possessions a few years ago. And it was a woman by the name of uh, Kate Elder or Big Nose Kate, who was involved with Doc Holliday. Every time you see the movie Tombstone or the movie Wider, Big Nose Kate is someone very attractive. Um, you have to come up and take a look at Big Nose Kate. She really did have a big nose. She was from Hungarian descent, and uh, she did. She wasn't. A, she wasn't a tiny woman. If you see the movie Tombstone, that woman that's playing Kate is very tiny. Uh, the real Kate was not like that at all. Um, Kate um, had some heft to her. Um, Kate could um, spar verbally with Doc in public. And that's one of the reasons why he liked her. She, she knew every curse word he did and could best him in public. And they were often, often in public having fights, um, calling one another names, uh, insulting one another, just, just the horrible things that they would say to one another. Um, in one particular instance, they're having this big argument and um, he goes back to the room and locks the door and she follows him, as women want to do, follow him to keep this argument going and finally gets into the room and they're sparring and he takes his pistol and knocks her over the head and knocks her out. So, you know, you have this kind of, you know, if they were alive today, the police would be at their home on a constant basis for domestic violence. I mean, that's the kind of couple that they were. Um, and then you'd see them, I mean, that would happen at one instance where they're fighting and then you'd see them later on in the day holding hands. So, I mean, they just, it was, it was a uh, bipolar relationship, I suppose. I mean, it just is very unhealthy. But um, Kate was always a prostitute when she was with Doc. There's a misnomer that um, Kate took care of Doc, but in my research and the things that I have of Kate's, nothing could be further from the truth. Kate didn't need anybody to take care of her. Doc needed somebody to take care of him. He was a, a, a gambler with um, tuberculosis, wasn't doing very well, and was a poor gambler, which is why he ended up shooting it out with the people that, that he was in card games with. Um, but this particular book, it's called According to Kate, The Legendary Life of Big Nose Kate, Love of Doc Holliday. Now I wrote, I've called it according to Kate because it's what Kate says happened. It's not what I say happens, it's what Kate says happened. She says that she was at the OK Corral when the gunfight took place, that she and Doc were sharing a room there and that she looked out her window and she watched the fight take place. And that when it was over with, Doc came back to the room and uh, he sat on the edge of the bed and he put his head in his hands and he just, just said, what have I done? What have I done? He had a graze across his hip from one of the bullets. And um, you know, a lot of people say, well, there's no way that somebody like Doc Holliday would say that. But they were, they were romantically involved. And you say things to your partner in that particular instance that you wouldn't ordinarily say to the guys down at the saloon. So um, I, I don't have any reason to doubt the things that Kate said. Um, in fact, I just enjoyed reading reading all of her work and her letters. I mean, she was incredibly feisty. <laughs> she was in her 80s and she ends up in a retirement home in Arizona and is still battling it out with people there, writing letters to the state saying, you got to do something about these people. They're not good to me. They're not good to any of us. They're stealing from us. I mean, she just was, uh, she was tough. And she always wanted someone to pay her a lot of money to write her book, uh, but no one would give her the money that she thought that she was worth. And so um, I mean, I'd be happy to be able, I think this would have, Kate would have been happy, although she probably would have been sad she didn't get the millions that she wanted to have. But uh, 
that's what this particular book is about. It's, um, and I've got a very extensive bibliography and in notes in the back. I do that with all of my books. I know a lot of nonfiction books like this don't necessarily have it, but I want people to know where all these sources come from. I don't want people to think, oh my gosh, that's just made up from nothing. I do read some nonfiction and I can't, I'm working on a book right now called Straight Lady, the story of Margaret Dumont and the Marx Brothers. Anybody remember Margaret Dumont from, uh, she just was this amazing actress and had it not been for her, a lot of the movies with the Marx Brothers wouldn't have gotten made because they were just, um, they were scoundrels and caused a scene. But uh, Margaret was somebody that was very calm and uh, was this, pompous dowager in every film that you ever saw her in. And just really, they called her the fifth Marx brother. But in some of the material that I'm reading, you go through and you read this book and there's nothing to say where they got that information. And I like for people to read the history and be able to say, I, I, did that really happen? I'm gonna, I'm gonna find out if it really happened. And so there's all the sources there. There's end notes and a bibliography. So you can see where this information came from. I mean. Um, Doc met, I mean, sorry, Kate met Doc in 1872 in St. Louis when he was just getting out of um, dental school. And uh, St. Louis was a hub of activity, activity for uh, prostitutes. And that's where she meets Doc. And so that's where their story begins. So um, anyway, it's just, it's a, it's a fun book. It's not a book for the kiddies, but you know, it's a fun book. One of the other books that I had a good time writing is uh, a book that I call Hearts, that, that's called Hearts West. It's a true stories of mail order brides on the frontier. Um, of course, when gold was discovered and everybody came west, there were a lot of men, not so many women. And the women that were here, they were professional women, as we just talked about, uh, not the women that you want to take home to meet mom. And so the men would start advertising in a magazine, magazine slash newspaper called Matrimonial News. Matrimonial News was based out of Kansas City, Missouri. And you could, um, they, also had, um, they also had offices in San Francisco and in Denver. So you could advertise for a wife there. Um, and they did, they would advertise for these wives and that would be seen back east women didn't really start looking for husbands or answering those ads or placing their own ad until roughly 1865. Can anybody guess why that would be? Why 1865? End of the Civil War, there weren't, very men, there weren't a lot of marriageable men left. So these women would advertise in um, the matrimonial news. And I love this particular book is the story about these women who advertised and what happened when they came West. Uh, some of the stories are happy. Some of them are um, tragic, but it's filled with these amazing ads. One of my favorite ads in the book is by a woman who writes, I'm fat, fair, and plan on losing no weight. I love her. This is perfect. This is just who I am. This is what's gonna happen. One of the women that I write in the book about, her name is Eleanor Berry. And Eleanor Berry starts uh, communicating with a gentleman who is in the Gilroy, California area. And, um, you know, they correspond. And when I say correspond, keep in mind, this is the old West. So after two letters, you better know if this, if this is real love, because it's not as though you're going to get a barrage of other letters. Usually two was the max where you would know this is the guy for me. So after two, this gentleman in Gilroy says, yes, I would like to marry you, uh, you know, and so she packs up everything that she has, packs up her, her trunk and her trousseau and travels west. And um, when, she gets, when she gets into California, she is um, held up, the stage is held up by four mask bandits. And she's, she's just so distraught about this and, and pleads with them to please let her go that she has her trousseau and she's on her way to get married, please let her go. They, they acquiesce and they do let her go. And she finally arrives at her future sister-in-law's home and she's changing her clothes, getting ready to walk down the aisle where she's gonna meet this man for the first time. And so she walks down the aisle and they're exchanging vows. And she says to herself, this guy's voice sounds really familiar. 
where have I heard this guy's voice before? Well, it occurred to her, he robbed me on the way west. That's where I heard this guy's voice before. So to find out what happened with Eleanor Bear, you'll have to get Hearts West. Uh, but this story is filled with wonderful, uh, this book is filled with wonderful stories like that. One of the uh, ladies that I write about is a woman by the name of Mary Elkinson uh, Richardson. And she marries a gentleman. She's a missionary. She wants to go west to be able to share the gospel with people. But her church will not allow her to do that because she's not married. And there's, there's a gentleman in the wagon party that wants to go west. And he's looking for a wife. So they kind of set the two of them up. And she writes in her journal after marrying him. I, and she writes in her journal saying, I can't imagine spending one moment with this person. But they do get married. And after 52 years, she writes in her journal, I can't imagine spending one moment without this man. So some of those stories are just amazing like that. And some of them, um, you're left at the altar wondering what to do now. Um, but I mean, it's just incredibly fun to see that part of history and where people are doing these kinds of things with eHarmony.com. And we think that this is a new, fresh idea. And it isn't a new, fresh idea. It's been going on for, for eons. And so has the um, idea of people lying about what they look like or their income, because that happened an awful lot. But women were smart. They figured out, uh, by 1870, they figured out, I'm going to make sure that if I say yes to this person, that they give me a certain amount of money that I can have that I just get to keep if I come out West and see you and think, I'm not marrying this guy. And they were smart enough to figure that out. So that's exactly what they did. They, um, they settled on a particular amount of money. Now there's also, uh, also in the old West at that time, there was something called picture brides where you would send away for a bride overseas and they would show up on the dock with, um, their picture on a stick and they would hold it up. And so the people, the men who advertised for a wife that were coming in, that, that was their picture bride. They picked them out that way. So um, this is a very interesting time in history that we always think there's, there's new things going on and really there's nothing new going on on the planet at all. We just think there is. Um, so that was Mail Order Brides. One of the other books that I had the privilege to, to write in, it's probably one of my favorites. It's called Entertaining Women, Actresses, Dancers, and Singers of the Old West. And this is about those women who made uh, a living performing. And there were a number of women who, um, who were incredibly gifted actresses and singers and dancers, and their stories just kind of are, are not fully told. And I was happy to be able to share a little bit about their life. One of uh, the ladies in the book that I write about is my favorite, one of my favorite stories. Her name is Klondike Kate. And she got her start in the Yukon. And her, she was known as the flame of the Yukon. And her act was she would come out dressed in red chiffon from head to toe, hat with red chiffon. She'd carry an umbrella with that red chiffon on it, everything red chiffon. And when the music would strike up, she would start dancing and singing and eventually spin around like a top as fast as she could. And the red chiffon would fly out and make it look like she was on fire. Hence the term, the flame of the Yukon. That was her act. If you saw it once, there was really no need to go back again. That's, that was it. Uh, but there was not a whole lot going on entertainment wise in the old West. So people would go and see that over and over again. Eventually, she wanted to change the act up, and she added roller skates to the act. So, you know, um, but she married a um, she married a bartender in the Yukon, who eventually became her her manager agent, and he booked her in places all over. I mean, as far as far east as St. Louis, as uh, far west as El Paso. I'm sorry, far southwest as El Paso. And he just kept her working all the time and she would perform and she would get paid lots of money and she would send the bulk of her money back to her husband who remained in the Yukon. 
after a few years of doing this, she decided that she was uh, not the youngster that she used to be. And he was having an affair with someone who was the youngster that Kate used to be and decided that he would send his mistress to Kate so Kate could train her in the act, which I think train her. What I don't, it's really not much to it, but okay. So um, while Kate is making all this money and he's, he's sending his mistress to get trained, he is taking her money, Kate's husband is taking her money and investing in Nickelodeons. And when Kate dies, he eventually divorces Kate and she dies a pauper. He ends up being one of the most wealthy men around and his theaters, his name was Alexander Pantages. All the Pantages theaters is from Alexander Pantages made with money that Kate Rockwell worked hard for. So you don't see Kate Rockwell's name up there, you see Pantages. So if you're driving by the Pantages Theater, spit and say, huzzah for Kate. So everybody will know where that came from. One of the other ladies that I've written about in the entertaining book um, is a woman by the name of Laura Keene. And Laura Keene is this fascinating woman who is an actress in England. And she's just incredibly talented. And she has a troop of people that work with her. One of the people that works with her is um, a Shakespearean actor that everybody loves by the name of Edwin Booth. And they're just a delight. All over England, they're a delight. People love them. And she is told, you know where you need to go. You need to go to the West, the, the American West, because you could do the, your, your acts there and get paid a lot of money. And so she does. She takes her whole troop west and begins performing. And she's a hit. They perform in San Francisco. People love her. She's just great. Her comedy troupe that she works with, everyone loves her. And a writer comes forward and he says, I've written a play for you. I'd like for you guys to do it. And we'll just see how this works out and see if it becomes popular. Well, the play is a play called Our American Cousin. And it, it is hugely popular. Everybody likes it, including Mary Todd Lincoln, who hears about this reading the San Francisco papers. And so she asks Laura Keene to come to Ford's Theater to do the play. An opening night is that fateful night where Lincoln is shot. But in the audience is John Wilkes Booth. On stage is Edwin Booth. John Wilkes Booth being in the audience is nothing new. He works at that theater. He's in plays at that theater. He gets his mail at that theater. So there isn't anybody that would raise an eye that John Wilkes Booth is there or say anything about the fact that Edwin Booth is in the cast because famous Shakespearean acting family. And, and so when, when they're rehearsing the show, John Wilkes Booth is in the audience, always watching, always making sure that he knows when the applause comes always making sure he knows when the laughs come. So at a particular time on that opening night, when Laura Keene is on stage delivering this amazingly funny soliloquy and the audience is laughing and applauding, at that time, he shoots Lincoln in the head. Now it's pandemonium in there when Lincoln is shot. People hear the gunshot. And of course he jumps down on the stage, um, you know, death to tyrants and limps off because he, he, he broke his leg in, jumping onto the stage. Um, but Laura Keene is still on the stage and she can look up. Has anybody ever been to Ford's Theater? It isn't, it isn't very big. I mean, you're standing on the stage. I mean, it's, it seems like you could just reach out and touch the, the uh, box where Lincoln was with Mary Todd Lincoln. So Laura Keene can see that the president is sitting like this with his head like this. And she knows what's happened. And Mary Todd Lincoln is of no use. You've just seen your husband being shot and uh, she's, she's just out of it. Laura Keene fights the traffic, trying to get out of the theater. She's getting, she fights her way to the, um, to the booth where Lincoln is. And she asks Mary Todd Lincoln if she could rest the president's head in her lap and dab his head with her handkerchief that she has. Mary never responds, but indeed that's what Laura does. She lays the president's head on her lap and her dress, and she's known for these 
incredible costumes. Now her costume is completely saturated with the president's blood. She stays with the president. She stays with Mary Todd Lincoln until they take him across the street where there he is pronounced dead. And then after that, um, she, Laura Keene is arrested for conspiracy to kill the president. Why? It's the reasons I just told you. John Wilkes Booth is the killer. Edwin Booth is in the, in the uh, play. It looks like you set all this in motion. It, and to them, to the authorities, it looks like there was something going on. So they question her for a number of hours and she's in this dress that's saturated still with the president's blood. Finally, they let her out and uh, she's so terribly upset about what she saw, about everything that's happened. And she tries to pull herself together and go back on the stage. By this time, the newspapers are filled with what Laura Keene has done and um, news about her dress, how her wonderful costume is saturated with the president's blood. So she is on stage trying to get back to work. And while she's on stage doing her play, people are yelling out, show us the dress. Show us the dress. They keep yelling that and they yell that so much and they disrupt the play so much she can't go on. The play is subsequently shut down. She's just heartbroken over this. She gives the dress to her husband and tells her husband to send the dress back to the dress designer and maker in Chicago. That happens, he sends it back. The dressmaker cuts up that dress and sends out the dress to a variety of different places. If you go to Ford's theater now, in the basement of the theater is a museum, and right next to Lincoln's stovepipe hat that he was wearing that evening when he was shot is a piece of Laura Keene's dress saturated with the president's blood. What's amazing about this particular story is the person who purchases that play, our American cousin afterwards, and then travels around the country and makes hundreds of thousands of dollars off of it. And that was Edwin Booth. He buys the play, travels with it, opens every show by letting everybody know that his brother is the one that shot the president. So that particular book is filled with those kind of, I'm, some, I'm like some sort of frustrated Western Paul Harvey. And now you know the rest of the story. But it's just, it's just amazing. These ladies this on the front of the book is an actress by the name of Maud Adams. And Maude Adams started out as a child actress. She was on stage by the time that she was nine months old. And Maude Actress becomes this incredibly well-known actress. She's an amazing thespian. Um, a guy by the name of Barry writes uh, a play called Peter Pan for her. She's just this impish elf-like lady. And she plays Peter Pan and makes that very famous. Um, when the theater is dark, she works on lighting for GE and works on lighting because the incandescent lighting on the stages are not very good. And so the lighting that she invents is what was used first in television picture tubes. She never got the patent for it. GE took the patent for it, but, Mar but Maud Adams is the one who invented that kind of incandescent lighting that, the first, that was used in the first televisions. So these women not only were incredible actresses, but they were very talented in so many other ways. Um, now, another book that I worked on that I think you'd mentioned that you just started reading, The Pinks. This is another aspect of women in history that a lot of people don't know that women were involved in. But there were a number of women who, who rank as the very first female Pinkerton operatives, spies, and agents with the Pinkerton National Detective Agency. And the first one is Kate Warren. And Kate Warren walks into Pinkerton's, Alan Pinkerton's office in Chicago in the mid 1850s and asks for a job. And he says to her, we don't have any jobs for secretaries, I'm sorry. And she says, no, 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 I don't wanna be a secretary. What I wanna be able to do is be an agent. And I can be this amazing agent. I can get into places that men could not get into. So please give me an opportunity. Alan Pinkerton is one of the very, he, he was very progressive at, for that time because he does, he does sign Kate on. He does 
He does let Kate come on and be a, a detective. There were uh, a number of men who were quite progressive that gave women an opportunity. Alan Pinkerton was one, Buffalo Bill Cody was another one. He was not uh, afraid to, to, to let women work and help manage his particular um, Wild West show. So Kate Warren is the first Pinkerton agent and she becomes uh, the head of what we now know as the Secret Service. Um, the, the logo for, let me just say this, Kate is one of the first people who helps the other Pinkerton agents uncover a plot called the Baltimore plot. And that was a plot to assassinate Lincoln before he took the oath of office. And they uncovered this plot to kill him. And Kate's job was to secret the president elect out of the Pennsylvania area and get him by train back to Washington so he could take the oath of office. Um, she secrets him out by having the president take his hat off and stoop way down and put on a shawl. And she told everybody that it was her sick brother that she was taking to a doctor in Washington to, to see, to help him get well. Um, so she stays with him on the train. She doesn't sleep at all on the train. There's um, this plot that someone's gonna try and derail the train and, and kill the president while he's on the train. So she stays with the president. She stays with him and awake all night long. The logo of the Pinkerton Detective Agents, and you come up and take a look at this, is an eye that's wide open. And the motto underneath is the eye that never sleeps. And that's because of Kate Warren. Um, and I just think it's absolutely fascinating that it was a woman that had a hand in that. Um, one of Kate's first assignments that she gets sent on is um, there was a bank robbery in um, Mississippi and the Pinkertons, she and two other agents get sent to Mississippi to, they already know who the murderer is. Um, there was a uh, half burned IOU in the stove, in the uh, stove pipe, uh, the, the oven that was there, the stove that was there, and it was signed Alexander Drysdale. And they also find a uh, monogrammed, uh, the initials AD off of a button on the floor. So it, it doesn't take, you know, a Pinkerton agent to figure out that Alexander Drysdale was the murderer. He murders this particular teller, bashes his head in with um, a hammer. Um, and so, Kate is sent down there. They're not, the Pinkertons weren't about getting, finding out a murderer. The Pinkertons were about getting the money that was stolen. And that's all that they cared about. They wanted the money that was taken. And um, Alexander Drysdale had taken more than $50,000 from that bank and they wanted it back, the, the bank wanted it back. And so when Kate goes down there with two other agents, the first thing that she does is befriend Mrs. Drysdale. And they have teas together and they spend some time um, knitting together and just quilting together. And finally, they, they decide that they're gonna go on a horseback ride. And that's when Kate puts her plan into action. Kate falls off of her horse on purpose in front of the Drysdale's plantation. And the Drysdale's feel a sense of obligation because they fell, she fell on their property. And so they take her in. And they say, we want you to settle in here and uh, recuperate here. And that's exactly what she's hoping to have happen. She wants to get close to Drysdale. So while she is recuperating at the Drysdale's plantation, in the middle of the night, she leaves a little trail of blood from Drysdale's bed to the hallway. At first, when he sees this, he thinks, oh, I've got a nosebleed. I didn't remember I had a nosebleed. But over the course of weeks, the trail of blood extends further. So eventually it extends all the way into the garden on a moonlit night when he gets up and follows it because now he is freaking out. He does not know what is going out. So he follows into the garden on a moonlit night and as he's out there watching this trail of blood, he looks up through a clearing in the trees on the moonlit night and he can see one of the other Pinkerton agents, the male agents, who has been disguised to look like the man he murdered, including the back of his head all bashed out. So 
They gaslighted this guy. Kate gaslights this guy over a period of weeks until he loses his mind trying to find out if, in fact, that money is safe, and he leads her right to the money. So, again, what happens after that, you'll have to get the book and find out. <laughs> but that's the pinks. And those women, I mean, there were more, I've written about more than a dozen of these pink, female Pinkerton detective agents. And they were phenomenal women who, who just did amazing things and um, were not afraid to work undercover for months, no one really knowing what the real names are. Um, I spent a great deal of time at the Library of Congress going over all of Alan Pinkerton's um, case notes on these particular um, subject matters. And it's just fascinating. And that's what this little book is about. Um, I don't know if now NBC is going to take it all the way. It doesn't look it doesn't look like they're going to, but hopefully someone else will pick it up. Um, well, was, I hope. There was a series on last fall. It was it was a Canadian, it was a Canadian show and it was a it was a rerun. They made it in 2005. And so they and so they re they reran it, but they were hoping to um, do a series on this about all the Pinkerton agents, not just Kate, because there were so many of them that did ama amazing things. So, um, and last year, I'm going to tell you about this. Well, what time is it? I because I'm, I'm prattling on, and sometimes I don't know. It's seven twenty. All right, I'm I'm going to be quick. Um, last year, I wrote a book. Uh, my, I had a book that came out last year, and it's great that it came out in COVID time because. The book was about the 19th Amendment. It was about suffrage and, and how um, women were uh, given the right to vote in the West long before they were given the right to vote in the East. And the West set the standard for what happened in the East. Um, it was, this was a movement, the suffrage movement started East of the Hudson, but it wasn't realized until it was West of the Mississippi. And I think it's just an amazing story and a phenomenal story about these women and it was a 90 year fight to get the right to vote. I don't like to even do anything I like for that long, but you know, I just am amazed that these women took this fight on for 90 years. But the 19th amendment was drafted by uh, a guy by the name of Senator Aaron Sargent and his wife, Ellen Clark Sargent in Grass Valley where I live. They wrote it there, they wrote it in uh, the 1870s and it wasn't ratified until 1920, uh, almost, almost verbatim the same word that they, that they, that they put together. Um, and so what's absolutely, just absolutely amazing to me is that these Aaron and his wife, Ellen, who was one of the first ladies who started a suffrage movement in the California area, um, they're on a train going from the West all the way to Washington where Aaron has got to be in the Senate and listen to some votes, listen to some bills that are gonna be passed. And their train is uh, held up for snow in Wyoming and other people get on and it's just packed. There's no place for anybody to set. And they, Ellen befriends this one woman who gets on, there's no place for her to set. They offer uh, this woman to, to share they say, why don't you share uh, our birth with my husband and I, you can stay in here with us. Um, and that woman turns out to be Susan B. Anthony. So what I find amazing is that, um, and that's what leads me to my next point that I wanna talk about is how the, the crafting of um, the 19th Amendment is done on a train. So, um, so train travel really was quite important. And that leads me to, That leads me to my other book that um, it's called Iron Women, The Ladies Who Built the Railroad. And um, when the Transcontinental Railroad, um, when, when it was finally completed at Promontory Summit and uh, Promontory Point in Utah, um, they made a big deal of making sure that there are no women in these pictures. And they said, the women shouldn't be in these pictures because yeah, they also left out the Chinese and a lot of the Irish. Irish built the railroad from the east-west. Chinese built the railroad from the west-east. But 
They wouldn't allow women to be in the picture because they said they didn't have a hand in laying any of the track or surveying any of the land. But I tell you, if it hadn't been for women, no one would have gotten on those stinking trains after they were built because they were very uncomfortable. Um, they were, men would have been happy if it was just a couple of buckets and a board to set on. It was women who came in and said, here's what we need to do to make this aesthetically pleasing. And here's what we need to do to um, Olive Dennis. I wrote about Olive Dennis. She was a civil engineer. And Olive Dennis comes up with these amazing, she invents comfortable chairs. She comes up with ventilation over the seats. She comes up with lighting. There are other women who invent, um, and they hold the patents for inventing uh, these filters that filter out the black smoke that's being spewed out all over the West. Women come up with, they, they figure out environmentally, this isn't good and what can we do about that? Women are the ones that um, hold a patent on railroad crossing guards. You would think, well, they would automatically come up with that, but it was a woman that came up with that. Um, one of the women I write about is a woman by the na name of Nancy Wilkerson. And Nancy Wilkerson in 1880 uh, answers this advertisement issued by the um, Humane Society to invent a humane way of transporting cattle from one part of the country to another part of the country. And uh, the, the winner gets uh, a cash award, and, uh, but the Humane Society recognized, you know, it, when men were cowboys were trucking those cows from one point to the next, they could stop for water, they could stop for grass. But when they were on a train, they didn't bother to do any of those things. So Nancy Wilkerson invents this, uh, this contraption on a rack and pinion kind of um, mechanism where the, the cows can get something to drink, they can also get something to eat. And so when they arrived where they were gonna go, they weren't emaciated and sickly and uh, they were healthy. Um, and so that was Nancy Wilkerson that did that. The other lady that I write about in the book, her name is Dr. Mary Pennington. And I just was so enamored of her because she invents what we know as the modern day refrigerator box car. And it was her, her invention that helped us to be successful in World War I. Had we not had the refrigerator box car, we wouldn't have been able to transport produce from one part of the country to the next part of the country and keep it fresh, or meat from one part of the country to another and keep it fresh. Um, the book is not only, it doesn't only include women who, who influence the uh, railroad for good, it also includes women who had an influence, a bad influence on the railroad. And one of those ladies is Laura Bullion, who is uh, a woman who takes part in the last train robbery in the United States. Um, and it's sad because prior to Laura Bullion, women didn't have to have their bags searched when they got on a train. But thank you, Laura Bullion. Now that was something that, that came into being after Laura had a hand in what she did. She was, um, she was involved romantically with one of the guys from the Wild Bunch. And uh, she, she teamed up with this particular gentleman and they go, um, robbing trains. And she finally gets caught and uh, has to go to jail for what she's done and eventually works for, in, ends up working as, at a department store uh, as a seamstress for women's garments. So it's an amazing story. So women did amazing things with uh, train travel. Uh, one of the other women that I write about is, pardon me? Oh, the telegraphers? Yeah, it's one of my before the first woman became a telegraph operator in 1872, it was mostly men. And their, their idea with that is that because being a telegraph operator was an itinerant profession, you could be a, a telegraph operator in Verde and be there for a little while, but then have to move here to Carson City. So you weren't really in one place for very long and they thought that that really didn't suit women very well. There's one woman in the book that suited her just fine. She had a guy at every place that she was at. So <laughs> she was very happy with that. She didn't care. Um, but I didn't write this in the book, but when I was doing the, one of the, this I did write in the book, one of the ways that they would um, 
make sure that women were well suited for this. Women that would came and, came and applied for the job as a telegraph operator, they would have five different machines going and the woman would have to tune in to the one machine they, she was supposed to be listening to, to transport this particular information. And women could do that because they could multitask. Back then they could multitask. What I didn't write in the book was a story about one gentleman that was a, a telegraph operator that some of the women just were so annoyed with him because he didn't focus. He was more interested in playing his guitar and going out at night to the different saloons and entertaining people with his guitar playing. And that gentleman ends up to be uh, Gene Autry. Um, a lot of people don't know that Gene Autry's first job was working as a telegraph operator. But. So the book is just filled with those kind of wonderful stories about what women did. And women had, had um, they played such an important role. As I, as I noted, these women played an important role in the history of the American West and shaping it and adding color from soil doves to suffragettes. And um, I just was pleased to be able to, to, to pen these books about these ladies. Um, I have a card that I wanna pass out to everyone. I have a book coming out next month it's called The Lady and the Mountain Man, Isabella Bird, Jim Nugent, and their unlikely friendship. It's the true story of this amazing Victorian woman in 1873 who was suffering from debilitating spinal problems and wore a steel cage around her neck because it wasn't heavy, it wasn't strong enough to support her head. And her health was just going downhill and her physicians in England told her that in order to improve her health, she needed to go abroad. And she had always wanted to see the Rocky Mountains. And so she ends up in Colorado in Estes Park where she wants to climb Long's Peak. No one will take her. She's a single woman and she's got health issues. No one wants to be responsible for that. Finally, uh, a renegade mountain man who's got one side of his face scarred and an eye missing from a fight with a bear agrees to take her and he takes her to Long's Peak. Um, there are bad people chasing Mountain Jim. And so in addition to them having to uh, withstand all that they did going up the mountain, you know, the terrain and the weather and her illness, but they also have bad guys chasing them. And, and the book is about those bad guys and the true story involving these bad guys that are chasing them. But on the way up the Long's Peak, she and Mountain Jim fall in love. And it's this amazing romantic story. Um, he was, she was a former, she's a former Sunday school teacher. He was at one time going to be a priest. And even though he's this renegade outlaw, he knows poetry like no one's business. So he could at the fireside at night, just share a poetry with her. And she just, her knees were weak from listening to this poetry and how wonderful he was. And except for that one side of his face, he wasn't bad to look at. Um, so the story is about uh, Isabella, who ends up becoming somebody who, at the, end of the, at the end of her time with Jim, no longer needs the cage around her neck and ends up being this amazing woman who travels all over the world and writes these amazing travel log books. And um, she writes about her time in China, her time in India, her time in, um, in Hawaii. And she's just very, she was the first woman to be inducted into the Royal National Geographic Society. So it's just an amazing story and it's called The Lady and the Mountain Man. Does anybody have any questions? Okay. Well, I think that we have books in the back and um, I'm happy to, to answer any questions that you might have. And um, thank you very much. Oh, I, I forget. I forget. Sorry. Thank you all for coming. Another exciting Francis Humphrey lecture series down. Um, so next month is going to be a little different. Uh, next month's lecture is part of the Jazz and Beyond Music Festival, and we don't have a piano. So, so we're gonna do it at the Brewery Arts Center's ballroom. Uh, it's gonna be uh, Squeak Steel, who's a, a local uh, jazz pianist. 
Uh, and she's going to be talking about like the jazz piano in the 20s. You know, we missed 2020, so we're doing the 20s anyway. Um, <laughs> anyway, so that will be up on our website to register for. Um, you don't have to, well, it's not a members only thing. You don't have to pay the admission because it's a part of the Jazz and Beyond Music Festival. Uh, so that'll be different, but still um, probably limited number of seating. So it's good to get a reservation. So there you go. And uh, thank you very much. And, and uh, go talk to Chris and uh, buy a book and, uh, you know, enjoy. <laughs>